Good evening. Glad to have you with us uh, tonight. Let me welcome you. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm the pastor here at Bethany Church, Kittery Point. Uh, we're excited for the content of what we're going to be delving into uh, this evening. Let me give you a couple of technical notes about the night and also the building, especially if you're new here. Um, there are restrooms out the back door and to your right or downstairs as well. Um, if we have to exit in an emergency, there's doors to go out that way and doors to go out this way as well. So don't think that's going to happen, but just so you know. Um, here's the flow of the evening. Um, Dr. Marcy Reeves is going to come up and share with us for about probably 40, 45 minutes. And then we're going to move into a question and answer time. So during the, uh, the presentation, if you have questions that are coming up, feel free to jot them down. We will have a microphone here as well. And we want to welcome everybody who's watching on Facebook. We've got a bunch of people who are viewing live on Facebook. So good evening to you guys. And if you have questions, feel free to leave them online and we'll be passing those up during the uh, question and answer session. So um, you can see Marcy's credentials here on the, uh, on the screen behind me. Um, she is well-trained. When she and I first started having a conversation about this night, and I was thinking about you know, the preparation and the build up to it. I can tell you that I haven't known Marcy long, but I can tell you that she's a very intelligent person and she's passionate about learning and growing and sharing wisdom and insight with others. I think she's naturally a teacher and you're gonna see that come through tonight. So if you can join me in welcoming Dr. Marcy Reeves. <laughs> making sure this is on. Thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. Thank you, Tim, for that lovely introduction. Um, and again, thank you all of the people, I'm looking over at the camera, that are jumping on on the Facebook Live. I have three small children who are home with my husband tonight, and I know there are many mamas and parents that couldn't make it because of this special event, not having childcare, so everyone can attend. So, <clears throat> I have a lot I want to say, so let's get going here. <clears throat> so, this is an outline of my presentation, but I always like to start with why I love science and why I got into uh, studying science. For those of you that don't know, I am a twin. <laughs> I am technically considered a genetic anomaly, and we're gonna talk about genetics tonight. And so I think from a very young age, this stirred a passion in me for wanting to learn, wanting to learn more about science and specifically genetics. So I've broken the talk into four uh, sections here. This is the outline. <clears throat> so I suppose I should say the title, scientifically speaking, does evolution make sense? First, we're gonna start talking about scientific perspectives, and we're gonna talk about some scientific language, as well as I'm gonna be defining some terms for you guys. Then I wanna get you thinking like a scientist, and then we're gonna dive into some molecular biology and some of my experiments, and we'll wrap up with kind of how we apply this new knowledge that we have. Oh, and I wanted to not forget, that's why I highlighted this, all of my slides are numbered, and so if you have a question about the content on a slide, you can jot down that number so then when we go back for Q&A, you can say, hey, on slide 18, and we can, we can talk about it. So you can pay attention to that. All right, diving right in, scientific perspectives. So technological advances have allowed scientists to become very effective at acquiring facts. And most scientists actually have a fairly narrow focus on what they're studying. So they're looking at cancer or heart disease or plant growth or something along these lines. Most educators are teaching what is published in mainstream textbooks, regardless of sort of their background and their training. And by the same token, most media outlets poorly convey information that is scientific. Definitely not 100% factual data is being um, provided. And so I want to make you aware of these perspectives just because we're here tonight and we're having this discussion. So if you are taking this information tonight and you go out and you talk to people, be aware that if you're having a discussion with someone, particularly with an issue that is considered controversial, like evolution or origins, you're talking about cells or life, you are going to encounter a differing of opinion. <laughs> so I want to provide you guys with some scientific insight so that you can take that and you can go forward with your discussions, whether it's with your family or your friends or people that you want to 
convey this information. And why is this important? Okay, I want you guys to, as someone who has been in the scientific realm for quite some time, both as a student coming up in it and now being someone that has earned a PhD, there tends to be this perception, this is very evident at the academic, certainly at the college level, that someone that has a PhD says, I have my PhD and you should just trust me. And I just think that this is a really terrible way to educate, it's a terrible way to convey information. And my job, my goal as a scientist that's been educated is to give you nuggets and stepping stones so that you can go out there with this information and tell people. That's why we're here tonight, right, is to learn. So I want to level you up to a PhD. <laughs> okay, so keep in mind that if you are having a discussion, it is very, very important that you simply present the data. You'll notice throughout the talk that I have a little soccer ball kind of jumping around. If any of you have ever played sports, you probably heard your coach say, keep your eye on the ball so you know what's going on. Okay, so <clears throat> scientists should be able to look at any question that they have, really anybody should look at a question that they have and present the information as true or false using the information that we have available today. Okay, so let me give you just a really quick example of this that's somewhat of a simplified approach, but children that think that the sun is rising in the east and setting in the west are not wrong in this observation. But as they are older and they mature and they look at actual data, we become aware that the fact is it's the earth that's rotating, the sun itself doesn't move, okay? So let me give you a little bit more of an approachable example here. In astronomy, it was claimed that the stars in the sun revolved around the Earth, okay? This was called a geocentric view, and I kind of like to think of this more like an egocentric view. We thought we were the center of our own little universe. <laughs> and so later, Copernicus actually claimed, well, I think based on observations and data that he then looked at closely, we realized that, in fact, the sun was the center of our universe, and the Earth rotated around it, revolved around the sun. So <clears throat> there are areas within science that are not... Uh, considered controversial and they are not up for debate. They are not something that people even question. Some of these we call fundamental constants, gravity, speed of light, chemical properties, okay? These are things that you can go out and talk to anybody that's in the scientific realm and you aren't gonna, that you aren't gonna meet someone that says, no, no, we are the center of our universe and <laughs> the sun revolves around us, okay? <clears throat> so let me give you a little bit more of a relatable example that is about drinking wine, okay? It was claimed red wine is healthy for you, so go out there and drink it up, okay? I heard this on the news, I heard this on the radio, and I remember when this data came out, and I was frustrated as a scientist because, in fact, there are many studies that have been published to learn the health benefits of drinking red wine. Specifically, it contains an antioxidant resveratrol. And I'm not going to go into the details of uh, resveratrol tonight, but um, I've put the reference of a paper up there if you're curious, but it has been linked to um, lessen coronary heart disease and, and it's good for neurological health as well. But in reality, to get statistically significant heart or brain benefits requires consuming a lot of wine. And so you might say, well, how much wine? <laughs> um, the studies are kind of all over the map depending on what's been done, but five to 100 milligrams of resveratrol per kilogram. If you're a visual person, hopefully you can see this. I know it's a little bit small. Greater than 500 to greater than 2,700 liters per day. <laughs> okay, it's a huge amount. And so you chuckle, but there's my little soccer ball. I want you to be aware because I don't know how many of you heard, right? Go out there, drink your red wine like it's really good for you. And there's some other nutritional information there. We're not here to talk about that tonight. But I want to tell you that because it's, this is like nutso when you actually look at the data. This is like your liver would be shot and the rest of your life. So <laughs> continuing on. One of the other areas that I want to point out, and this is kind of important for any of you that are um, either students in the education system or reading textbooks, especially if you're someone like me that loves to learn, there is a scientific 
language that is um, l very much layered with evolutionary terms and layering. And you could think about this kind of analogous to a cake, where you've got actual experimental data as the cake, and you've got this icing layered on top of it, and you sort of can't really see the real data unless you really dive in and look at the data. So I'm going to put up an example here of a paper. The, the paper is listed at the bottom. And I want to point out that this is a paper where they are investigating cell death. They're looking at the processes of, of cell death and what happens in the body when that happens. This has nothing to do with evolution, but I want you to look at the evolutionary language. And I'm going to turn here to read this so I don't mess it up. But, quote, the origin of eukaryotes in the advent of multicellularity are monumentous evolutionary transitions that involved invention of several fundamentally new functions. Okay, hopefully you can see that there, but I've crossed out the evolutionary language. And so I'm gonna read this quote again. The facts and the data remain exactly the same. The origin of eukaryotes and multicellularity involved invention of several fundamentally new functional systems taking out that layering and just putting the information there. Because what happens is this is taken out of context, and then people say, look, there's this evidence for evolution, when really it's a little bit unclear, okay? So I just want to make you aware, because this is another point, if you're getting lost in some of the technical stuff I talk about later, this is something to remember if you're going and looking at it yourself, okay? Keeping that in mind, please, please do not go out there and discredit every scientist that went out there to do some great scientific work from the past. So I'm going to talk a little bit about dates. I'm typically not much of a historian, but Darwin published On the Origin of Species, and I want you to pay attention to that title, Origin of Species in 1859. Okay, not a soul in this room was alive. This was 161 years ago. I think some people are unaware of how long ago it was. A little bit more information here. Watson and Crick are the scientists credited with discovering DNA as a double helix in 1953. Depending on your age in this room, this was before my lifetime. <clears throat> the sequencing of the human genome was completed in 2003. I remember when this happened. It was so exciting. We were all like, oh my goodness, the scientists have figured it out. <laughs> And I'm here to tell you an analogy that if you could think about the human genome as a big, gigantic library full of textbooks, we have documented every letter, but we don't know what they're written in. We know real small, like maybe the children's section, we've started to figure out genes and, and what those instructions are, but the majority of the non-gene coding regions of DNA, and I'm not going to talk about those details tonight, but we really don't know very much. We've got it all documented, awesome, we can continue to study it, but I just wanna make a note because I think people thought that in 2003 we like figured it out. <laughs> so I want to let you know that we want to basically be looking at data that we have today because even in the world of science, 2003 is a long time ago, okay? so. Be careful to detect if you're looking at data and some of what I'm talking about tonight, if it might have somewhat of a biased spin on it, whether you're looking in your textbooks or, or looking at research things going forward. So I think that scientists generally, and if you can't tell from my own ambitions talking with you tonight, we really, really ambitiously go out there and ask our questions. But harm can come to science, not by people hoping to find a particular result, but by trying to suppress results that go against their hopes, okay? And I point that out because I think it's important that we have the scientific community, we don't want to discredit them from the past, but if they have this hope and they're like, I really want this answer, it's wonderful, but we need to make sure that we look at the data and we, we align it with, with the facts. So, as scientists, we also need to remember, because I'm going to get you thinking like a scientist in a moment, that we can only test what we can observe, okay? And so as our technological advances have gotten better, well, we can 
gather more data, but now we need to figure out where to go from here, okay? And correlation is not necessarily causation, okay? You laugh. Potatoes have skin, I have skin, therefore I'm a potato. Okay, this, I, I put this up here because I think that sometimes people think, oh, scientists have all this information and they're kind of drawing these conclusions and we chuckle at this, but when we're talking about data that is you know, really important, we really need to make sure that we're drawing good conclusions. And I'm going to get to that later, which is why I put this up here now. The other thing that's super important is to define any terms. So I'm going to dive right in to defining evolution because I fr frankly don't like that word <laughs> because it's this broad term and depending who you're talking to, they don't know what you're talking about. I've got it broken up into three parts here. Adaptation. This is very, very straightforward. Most people don't have any trouble understanding this. This is simply put, change over time. Okay, and this is a figure of the finches that Darwin put in his book. And you can see here that they all have different shaped beaks. Okay, and he just noted that over time, depending on where the finches lived on the Galapagos, whether it was tropical or arid, their beaks would um, be able to eat the different seeds based on the environment. So pretty straightforward, that one. Universal common descent, okay? This is the idea that all organisms today are descended from a single common ancestor, okay? This, oop, there it goes. This paints a picture that life on Earth is this giant branching tree, okay? You see this in textbooks, it's this tree of life, okay? And I just want to point this out that in this case, A, B, C, D, E would be different species, and these are not exact numbers here. This is just for the figure's sake. That's not data, but I just want to point that out. And this final definition, I realize this is wordy, mechanism of change, but this is where I'm going to spend the bulk of what I'm talking about with molecular biology tonight, so I really want to define this, and there's a reason I have chosen to put natural selection under this mechanism of change. I'm going to read this. Natural selection is a process whereby organisms that are better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring, right? Pretty straightforward. But the part that I really want to point out to you guys is that there's a claim that mutations in DNA provide the variation upon which natural selection is acting, okay? And this is really important because we're going to come back to this, but this is thought to have the power to produce new forms of life. All right. So I shared these definitions with you, and I've talked a little bit about scientific perspectives. I want to make very clear that this is not just my perspective. These are two quotes from scientific societies within the academy, and I'm going to read them. I'll go ahead and put them both up here. The American Chemical Society has urged education authorities to affirm evolution as the only scientifically accepted explanation for the origin and diversity of species. This is a second quote. The Royal Astro Astronomical Society of Canada is, quote, unequivocal in its support of contemporary evolutionary theory that has its roots in the seminal work of Charles Darwin and has been refined by findings accumulated over 140 years. Okay, so this is not just me sitting up here saying this is the perspective. These are quotes from societies that are out there in the education systems approving publications and doing the kind of lecturing that I'm doing, okay? I'm going to take a bit of a turn here and define intelligent design for you. You could define this in several ways. But I'm very careful in how I've just defined it here tonight as of where it stands within the scientific community. Intelligent design is really a hypothesis whereby certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. And I think that intelligent design is something that we can learn more about. But I want to be very clear that for any discussion I have, as a scientist or otherwise, it is a scientific view to study origins. And so if you're going forward tonight and you're talking to people and you use the term intelligent design, we want to be very mindful to pull in data when we're having these discussions and be very careful to define some of the terms that we've talked about tonight. That's why I've taken this very careful time to go through all of this with you guys. I want to make a distinction here that creation or creationism follows the biblical account and contrasts the fact that intelligent design is going to start with the principles of science and it's going to show how those principles are attributing life to an intelligent designer. 
Okay, so it's a scientific approach. It's a, it's a way to study science. At this point, I am not calling it a theory, and I don't think any of the people within the realm of the life sciences call it that, and so that is why I call it a hypothesis. We can talk more in the Q&A about why I feel about that and where we are going forward. But for the purposes of time, I'm going to keep going. Okay, I want to get you guys thinking like a scientist. I want you to think from the perspective of intelligent design and, and make some observations. So if we're thinking about design, we should think about things that we know are designed. Buildings are designed, clothing is designed, electronics, I mean these, these crazy smart devices that we have, they are all intelligently designed to serve a purpose, okay? For our purposes tonight, thinking like a scientist, we're going to take something that most people can relate to, and we're going to look at an origami crane, okay? <clears throat> so as a scientist, we might ask, how do we make an origami crane? Are, are there steps? Are they numbered? How many steps are they? Remember, as a scientist, we can only test what we can observe, okay? So then as a scientist, we might say, well, we observe origami cranes do not happen by accident, okay? Well, why do they not happen accidentally? Well, origami cranes are complicated and they're hard to create even on purpose. I don't know if any of you have tried, but there are a lot of steps and they are ordered and they are numbered and they are complicated. <laughs> and that pales in comparison to the complex, living, breathing, flying origami or crane. And that's not origami crane. Okay? And so there is information to make an origami crane. There is also information for the invention or the origin of the living, breathing, flying crane, okay? So thinking like a scientist, we might say, okay, we've got these observations and we are gonna conclude that for an origami crane to happen by accident, it would be very unlikely or improbable. I wanna point out something here, that this approach of observation is exactly the approach that Darwin used to generate his theory 161 years ago and he had very little information compared to what we have today. They thought cells were kind of these jello-like blobs. They really didn't know what we know today. I also want to take a moment to underline this word improbable because we're going to talk technical, and if I start to lose you in the technical, I want you to think about the origami crane and probability in this example, okay? So moving forward, thinking like a scientist, scientists have to ask questions. And we recognize that we live in a complex world, and we recognize that all the information of this world must originate from somewhere, okay? And I want to give a real relatable example here that I think children recognize this more innately than as we get older. Sometimes I think we tend to forget. But a child doesn't look at a tied shoelace and assume that it happens accidentally. They recognize that the information for how to tie a shoe must come from somewhere or must be taught to them by someone who knows it. Okay, So if we're thinking like a scientist and we can only test what we can observe and we have to generate a testable question, we might say, well, how did life originate? What are our origins? Okay, these are wonderful questions, really hard to approach from a scientific perspective. So we might say, well, how did we get all the different life forms that we see today? Okay, that's narrowing the focus a little bit. We might ask, well, how do changes in those life forms occur? Physical changes, maybe genetic molecular changes. Now we're getting into the molecular biology side. As a molecular biologist, we could ask, well, how likely are probable are changes? How likely are the arrival of new inventions inside the cell on a molecular level? Now we're talking about new things inside the cell. That's something we can go out and test. And that's what we did. Okay, so let's recap. We talked about some scientific perspectives. I want you to remember invention requires information, and we can only test what we can observe. Scientif scientists generate testable questions, and if there's an argument, that it will be shown to be true and correct with the correct data. So again, thinking about the children that think about the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. Once they have a full picture, they know the data, they can move forward. There's no argument to be had. Okay, let's dive into the molecular biology and my experiments. We are going to start by talking about proteins. <laughs> proteins we get from what we eat or they are made inside the cell. Okay, amino acids are the molecular building blocks for proteins. There are 20 standard amino acids, and they look like this. If you draw out the sequence of amino acids as this kind of beads on a string, you would see this in textbooks. You might see this in publications. We can look at the genetic code 
and we can get this sequence. For the purposes of time, I'm not going to talk about it, but there are more than 20, and if you want to talk about that afterward, I'm happy to do so because I've done work on them. <laughs> The beads on a string are actually ordered and folded inside the cell into these 3D structures. Here they look like these kind of cartoon ribbon shapes. This is based on the properties of the amino acids, but it's also somewhat complex on how this is done inside the cell. The structures can be quite complex, and I don't put this up here to intimidate you, but to kind of walk you through this process that we cannot, as scientists, look at the beads on a string, this amino acid sequence, and say, we have this sequence, so we get this 3D protein. Then we have this sequence, and we get this 3D protein. It is not a linear correlation. And in fact, to generate these images for you, we take a crystallized protein structure, which is another technique, as well as electron mi microscopes, and we look at the crystallized proteins and the solid proteins and the linear sequence, and then we can generate what the 3D structure would look like inside the actual cell. Does that make sense to everybody? I kind of want to, before I go forward, get some nods here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, everybody's like, wow. Um, okay. We're going to talk about enzymes because people are like, oh, they hear this word enzymes and they kind of get eyes glazed over. Enzymes are proteins, guys. Pretty straightforward, they are proteins. They are specific proteins that carry out vital, vital functions inside the cell, okay? Enzymes um, <clears throat> can be grouped together in families based on a similar shape. And so I like to give an analogy that if you could think about your hands as um, different enzymes, you could have this, this one over here doing this thing and this one over here doing this thing, and they might be similar, but they aren't exactly the same, and they aren't exactly doing the same things, okay? I meant to put that up there for you guys. <laughs> um, this is a family of different enzymes. They all do different things, and they're color-coded here in these images, but I just want to point out that if you look at kind of column A versus column B versus column C, they're similar, but they're not identical. And I point this out because they all do something different inside the cell. So there's some very complex chemistry going on here. That's what defines them as being an enzyme. Okay, so hang in. Sometimes I think we can think more simplistically that maybe enzymes are like, hmm, what's going on here? Well, we need to, to ask, you're thinking like a scientist, right, a question. So we are asking, would it be possible for one enzyme to do the function of another enzyme? Okay, and I've got up here a golf club and a hockey stick because I want you to be kind of be thinking about the comparison of two things that might look similar, but enzymes are quite a bit more complex than that. You could go out and whack a hockey puck with a golf club and you still might score a goal. In the case of enzymes, it's more complex than that. And so more specifically, in our laboratory we asked, I want you to keep this question in your mind, would it be possible for enzyme A to, quote, evolve the function of enzyme B? Okay, and I'm going to dive into this now, asking, is there a new function here? Because you have to get a new function to do some of these other things that we were asking. Okay, so these are some of the, the two enzymes that we're going to look at here. Diving into a little bit more molecular biology before I talk about what we did, I want to give you some more background. So the DNA is the information for the protein to be made. Okay, and here's a, just a picture here to make an analogy for you of a section of DNA. This would kind of be analogous to a recipe, okay? So you have a gene. The gene is the information or the instructions for a protein to be synthesized inside the cell. The DNA is made up of nucleotide bases, okay? We, for short here, are calling them A, C, T, or G. This is actually a code. This is a genetic code. Watson and Crick discovered the 3D DNA shape. It was actually later the, the same scientists discovered the actual genetic code, that it's this simple sort of like a binary language to my computer people out there, ones and zeros. This is the code for these genes, all right? You could kind of think of this analogous to the ingredients. It is really not a linear correlation here, but for the purposes of what I want to talk to you about tonight, you can think about it in this way. It is the proteins, though, that are actually carrying out the functions inside the cell. Cellular processes are going to process the DNA information, the instructions, and you're going to get the desired result, in this case, obviously, the cookie, okay? But so whatever it is that you're looking at, you would look at the DNA to see what's happening to the protein. 
And that, there's a reason that I'm telling you this. The DNA nucleotide bases are paired, A to T and C to G. And so you hear all the time about mutations. Oh, they have a mutation, different mutations going on. Well, what exactly does that mean? This is what it means, that if you have an original piece of sequence here, G-A-T in this case, and the sequence has changed to G-A-G, you've actually changed the amino acid, okay? So the amino acid here, this is the code for this amino acid, aspartate, and it's changed to G-A-G. You could reference this back, think back to the analogy of the recipe. In some cases, you can have uh, an amino acid mutate, a change at the DNA, an amino acid mutation would result, and so this would be like changing butter to oil, right? In other cases, it absolutely does not work. Butter to kale, okay? You're not gonna get the desired result if you're using kale instead of butter. Okay, so <laughs> I point that out and I share this with you. I remember going to talks and it's like, why are they giving all this information? I want you to know this because it's important for understanding the complexity of where the DNA changes happen and what happens downstream. So what did we actually do in the lab? We have to generate testable questions and then we have to actually go out and test them. So this is the method that scientists, all scientists use this approach if they're asking questions about what's happening inside the cell on a molecular level. We start out using what's called a gene library, okay? Think about this just like a regular old library that's full of textbooks and you wanna study a family in this section of books, you go and you look at that section of books, okay? We start out with our genes that we wanna study we can do uh, techniques to create mutations, and what will happen is you'll end up with a mutated protein. We then, of course, you have to put them back in the cell first, and then you get the mutated protein. So I'm, I'm pointing out that this is the method that we used to carry out the mutations with the questions we were asking. Remember, think back to the question. We want to see if we can get a new function in enzyme A to be like enzyme B. Okay, I wanna just point out for a second that we also know a lot of things about how bacteria grow. They're a great organism when you're studying things like this because they reproduce every 30 minutes so you can grow up a huge population in a very short amount of time and you have lots of cells to look at your mutations and send things off for sequencing, things like that. So I just wanna point that out. So remember, we asked, would it be possible for enzyme A to evolve the function of enzyme B. I want to point out for the purposes of our experiment, these enzymes, these are the names of them, Cable and BioF. BioF synthesizes biotin, okay? That's its enzyme function. And biotin is vital for cellular survival. So the cell either needs to have a functioning BioF to synthesize biotin, or it needs to be present in the media in the environment that the bacteria are growing, okay? So <clears throat> we asked, we actually hypothesized to mutate cable to function like BioF, specifically where the biotin synthesis is carried out. In fact, we predicted that we could mutate cable to be like BioF. And I realize this is a bit of, um, of a big image to look at. This is an overlay of the two proteins together where the identical amino acid sequence is in kind of this gray color. We changed the areas that are highlighted there in blue, green, and yellow, and that little red molecule is in fact biotin. And so we asked if we mutate these little areas right where this chemistry is happening, can we get cable to synthesize biotin, mutated cable to synthesize biotin, okay? <clears throat> and so the results of this Spoiler alert, no. <laughs> we, we were not able to get this to work. We were unable to design an experiment and make very specific changes in the area to get cable to function like BioF where biotin synthesis occurs. Remember, we made these mutations in the DNA and so the resulting cells died, okay? I wanna just say for the purposes of being accurate that we have all the controls where in parallel we have cells that are growing, that are thriving in the presence of biotin, and we can take our mutated sequences and we can send them off and we can confirm that what we said we designed to do, we in fact did. Okay, so there's this growing realization. This is a different paper. These folks were asking a different question than what we were asking. They, 
This has become a famous quote somewhat, though. If nature did it, why can't we? We're these really smart PhD scientists. This is a quote from the paper. Interchanging reactions catalyzed by members me of mechanistically diverse superfamilies might be envisioned as easy, an easy exercise in redesign. After all, if nature did it, why can't we? But changing activities of superfamilies has been attempted, but few successes have been realized. Okay, if you're falling asleep, I want you to pay attention and hear me now, because this is a very important distinction. These scientists that are quoting this data right here, they have done experiments where they're taking enzyme A that functions poorly and making mutations, and enzyme A functions better. It is still enzyme A. Okay, there is no new function here. And this is a very, very important distinction in what I'm going to talk about because the questions that they were asking are, can we do it? We're taking something and then they're saying, well, we evolved it. Okay, the language that they would describe would be that they evolved and they've got this better system in place. Okay, so I, I want to point out that distinction because I, I know I'm giving you guys a sip from a fire hose as some may have heard. <laughs> okay, so we have this guided approach. We thought, golly, we made all these changes, and so now what? Now we decided we're going to use an unguided approach. In fact, this is what would happen in nature. We've got random mutations that are occurring. We're going to just do our experiment in an unguided way and have random genetic mutations occurring. Okay? We actually had critiques of our original work saying, well, you just chose the wrong mutations to make. Um, we also had people say, well, you, you clearly chose the wrong pair of enzymes to compare. So perhaps we should compare A to C, D, E, F, et cetera, okay? So <clears throat> another spoiler alert, our random approach also failed. So for those of you that are like, oh my gosh, she's just talking a mile a minute, what, let's get to the point here. We found no enzyme that was within a single base mutation of evolving into enzyme B, or in this case, BioF, as I've already told you what it's called. We tried all possible single base mutations, and when I say single base, I mean that nucleotide change happening at the DNA makes the change at the amino acid. We tested nine different enzymes from the same family, and by we, I mean me. <laughs> this is the work that I did. So I want to just... Um, get us out of our molecular biology here, and just imagine if you were that these letters were the amino acids, okay? And right here I've just put up 20 letters. I very carefully made genetic mutations at every possible amino acid sequence for all nine genes, for all amino acids in all of the locations of the amino acids. <laughs> we, and so to give you an idea, this work that is shown right here on this slide took me three years. So if this gives you an appreciation for how long this takes to confirm, send off for sequencing, grow the bacteria, etc. So <clears throat> the conclusion here, this is um, the paper. If anybody wants this, I'm happy to share it now that you've gotten kind of the full picture. If you'd like to look at the real technical side of things, this is it. Um, some of the work that was done um, for the guided approach is in a separate publication. Uh, this came out in 2015. We published this in 2015. I completed the work in 2014, so to give you an idea. But <clears throat> I want you to think back to how I defined evolution, okay? Evolution as not a mechanism of change. If enzymes cannot be evolved to genuinely new functions by unguided means, no matter how similar the enzymes may seem to be, the evolutionary theory as a mechanism of change is false. Okay, this is a big, a big thing to digest, okay? Recall, this is the definition, I should put this up here, sorry guys, um, that specifically the mutations in the DNA are providing this variation that natural selection can act upon. So you hear all the time, oh, natural selection and DNA mutation, and people kind of throw their hands up in the air and say this is evolution, okay? So if evolution is ascribing to this inventive power that natural, selec natural selection can do, it, it doesn't work based on this data, okay? Natural selection can only home in on something once it exists, it cannot actually invent. Ooh, deep. Um, 
So this is a gaping hole in the evolutionary theory, okay? I hope that this makes sense to you guys. So I have a little bit more that I want to talk about because there's another side to this that I often get a lot of questions. So of course I mentioned to you that people said, well you chose the wrong mutations to make and then of course we tried lots and lots of mutations and that still didn't work. The other side to this story is, has to do with time. And that's like, how do you do this in a laboratory? You're talking about something that would have taken billions of years to occur. The, they're just, that just, it just must happen in the amount of time. So we asked the question, well, how long could this take? A lot of people want to know the answer to this. So how is it possible to figure this out? Simply put, calculation. So a process that involves random occurrence, such as mutation or change, requires calculation using known data. We know how long it takes bacteria to reproduce, and we know the rate at which random mutations occur. This is similar to using the proportion of lottery winners to entries to figure out your probability, there's that word, of winning. Okay, let me give you a really quick math lesson. For those of you that haven't taken math in a long time, looking at exponential numbers, the number 1,000 would be written as 1 times 10 to the 3, or just 10 to the 3. A million would be written as 10 to the 6. So I want to give you an example that's not so molecular biology, a little more relatable. This is a 10-dial lock. Most of us only have like four dial locks. But for this example, it's 10. With 10 to the 10 possible combinations, there is only one correct combination that will actually open the lock, okay? So hopefully this is relatable. We actually have 20 amino acids instead of just 10 to choose from, but there you go. That's a bit of an example that hopefully can be relatable. So here are some of our um, <coughs> questions that we ask regarding calculation. Scientists have discovered this collectible data of mutation rate over time, and we use this to generate calculations based on our results. Okay, so I, I'm not going to get into this tonight, but I want to point out if you have questions that we do know a lot about mutations. They can be good or they can be bad. For the most part, they are detrimental to the cell, cell death, or even, even whole organism death when you have mutations. Okay, and so I think appreciating all of the possible changes that can occur versus the time available can be a little bit difficult to wrap your brain around, but there are vastly, vastly more wrong, wrong DNA arrangements that produce dead proteins versus correct DNA arrangements. And what were our actual results based on our data? 10 to the 15 years. Okay, this is based on growing your cells in bacteria with a reproducible rate, new generation, every 30 minutes. Okay, and it's very, very likely that, that you would need more time than this based on our results. Okay, so <laughs> the universe would need to be 100,000 times older than it is in order for maybe a new invention to happen in the randomness of the search space because there's just so many wrong mutations that can happen. Okay, so think back to the origami crane. Accidental invention is improbable and therefore physically impossible. Okay, there is just not enough time. So, keep your eye on the ball. No data today explains origins, new functions. No data today show one species changing into a completely new species. So this, I told you, paints a picture. It is in fact a picture because we see, observe, we look out there and we see birds and plants and all the wonderful humans in this room, okay? We could even look at our enzyme data and instead of calling that a tree of life, we could look at the different enzyme letters here and we, we knew we couldn't get A to B, okay? So this data could represent our A to B change. It just doesn't work. That's that second definition of Darwin's theory, you guys, in case you missed that, all right? So it's not possible. So scientists, I'm bringing you back to the potatoes. Scientists need to be very careful how we draw conclusions based on our actual data and what we have today that is different than the scientists that came before us, okay? So let me wrap up here. What now, what are we doing with all this information? Okay, now we have all this and you guys are like, wow. I hope you're like, wow. Scientific arguments that are true will be shown to be correct. New data is going to confirm the scientific argument. Simply put, it's not an argument, it's data. We're following the data, okay? So 
I really want to offer you a bit of a retreat from Darwinism, and then I really, really want to hear your questions because I think that this is where I'm hoping to go. If we recognize that life cannot be an accident, we are affirming that it was intended and that it was designed. Okay, this claim that evolution did invent proteins and cell types is only legitimately scientific if we can show that, but we can't. And this paper is more than 100 years old. It came out in 1904, and I'm just going to read it. Natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival. Okay? And we have a lot of new data that says that. So, Despite the rationale, though, for intelligent design, some will conclude that science has disproved this because intelligent design calls for a designer. Okay, so remember at this at the beginning, we are simply here to follow the data, okay, and ask questions, and ask hard questions, okay? So now, here you are. You're taking the steps, and you're up here. You've all earned your PhDs in molecular biology. So if this is where our thoughts go, this is where our questions go, are we allowed to go with them? I hope so. Thank you very much for listening to me. Oh, I did good on time. <laughs>so we're going to move into a uh, time of uh, questions and answers. We do have a, a microphone there and we'll uh, we'll start a line if you want to ask a question live, you can do that. For those who are watching on Facebook Live, if you want to um, put questions in the comments, those will be sent over to me and I'll be asking them to Marcy. You see I have a chair over here cuz I'm not going to even try to stand next to her. I'm just going to go like yeah, what she said. So I'm going to sit over here. But let me let me um, let me start with a question for you Marcy. One thing um, that is I think a lot of people wonder about in relation to this is um, what is the deeper motivation you found as a scientist, therefore, for keeping Darwinistic evolution as like this primary kind of broad philosophy or approach to how science is done? Great question. So I like the analogy that um, the Darwinian theory of evolution is like an old brick building with a crumbling infrastructure. And as we are starting to realize that this is crumbling,